The Batman was absolutely the best Batman movie. Yes, Snyder cultists may not like to hear that, and Marvel fanboys may hate the idea of serious comic book movies being good, but them's the breaks. It's my opinion, and it's the right one when it's on this channel. Why? Because it's the best visualization of my interpretation of Batman. As with any adaptation of a character, that's the breaking point for many people. If it's not the version that they want to see of that character, it's instantly bad and has no merit. It's why many people dislike Man of Steel, and why I absolutely hated Joss Whedon's failures for Hawkeye in the Avengers movie. But that's a different rant, and maybe I've got something in the works for that that won't be instantly pulled from YouTube. The point is, is that Batman as a character has existed since the dawn of the golden age of comics and will exist until the fall of merchandising. There is a lot of history with this character, and even today, the now is going to be from 2016, even though there's been 100 plus issues of Batman-specific titles in that time. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. This is the then and now comparison of Batman number 1 from 1940 and 2016, beginning with the title history as always. June 1939, when Superman made his glorious debut onto the comic scene with Action Comics number one. The success of this superhero meant that National Comics wanted more, and Bob Kane created, air quote, the Batman, with a hyphen in between, in response. However, Bill Finger is actually who made the character we know and love today. Bob Kane did officially create the character but that character looked essentially like a recolored Superman, with the only difference being a pair of stiff wings and a domino mask, and also being blonde. Bill Finger is the one that decided on the now-iconic cowl, a more ribbed cape to keep the batwing motif without looking so clunky, and dropped the color scheme to a darker gray-black and initially purple gloves, but that would be dropped relatively quickly. Bill Finger is the one who made Batman who he is, and while this is a full rant for a separate video, it wasn't until 2015 that DC Comics would officially, formally begin to even credit Finger as a co-creator. There are a few times I'll say that the great digitalization was a good thing. I'm meeting you halfway, hippies. So, Bill Finger and Bob Kane created Batman in the pages of Detective Comics number 27 in May of 1939 and was, to put it as basic as possible, just another pulp detective except unlike those in Domino's mask or bandanas, he had a cowl and a, a semi-fully fleshed out gimmick. He was also a very successful character and a year of high sales later would spin off into his own book in the spring of 1940. While Bob Kane and Bill Finger would be the main creative team on the initial Batman series run, Jerry Robinson and George Russos would collaborate and act as assistants and inkers and fillers on the book. It did begin as a quarterly book, but the sheer popularity of it, it would hop to a bi-monthly release schedule. The increase in work also meant that more people would come in as creators, although Bob Kane would still be considered the sole creator and everyone else would work essentially as ghostwriters on the property. It's not really fair, but that is kind of how the comics industry was back then and even works today, sadly. In this time, though, a ton of great names for the era would ghost draw and write, but the most important would be, and I swear I'm not making this name up for anyone who doesn't know, Dick Sprang who would become the most consistent artist and be the person who ultimately solidified the now iconic golden age of Batman look, with his designs generally tightening up and allowing for a consistent feel. Oh, and of course, since Batman and Superman were the top two comic book characters of the era, and they were both owned by National Comics, eventually they would appear side by side in the world's finest comic books, although it was originally called the world's best in 1941, Unlike Superman, however, after World War II, even while superhero comics were waning in popularity, Batman stood firm as the foundational character because of the variety in his storytelling. More on that after I talk about Batman number one, but essentially, with him just being a man in a cowl, they could give him both mobsters and monsters, have him time travel, or just have him stop smugglers. But there was a growing problem with that sort of popularity, namely the... Won't someone please think of the children? Mentality 
that has and will always be a problem for society, especially when underground or low-level media becomes mainstream. No video involving the Golden or Silver Age is ever truly complete without discussing the Comics Code Authority, Frederick Wortham, or the Seduction of the Innocent, a now standard scare tactic of, no, it's the media that's wrong with your kids. A major focal point of this outrage? Well, horror comics was the cause of juvenile delinquency, Batman was making everyone gay. I wish I was joking there, but in the one defense I'll ever make, it is a bit suspect that Bruce Wayne shares a bed with Dick Grayson and, well, does things like spank him. Batman does a lot of spanking in the Golden Age. It's still stupid today, but I don't want to bog this down with talking about the Golden Age. If you want the long-form rant, check out basically any comic I've talked about that was around the turn of the ages. So anyways, then the Silver Age happened, and Batman, as well as basically every comic during the 50s and 60s, would become essentially fluff camp silliness thanks to the CCA, making it so that no real drama could exist in a comic book format. Granted, some people would get around this by making them more magazines, but Batman would continue on as a title. Yes, this is where everyone gets silly and the bat 2 c wouldn't be so far out, but I'm trying my best not to bog this all down with a ton of history because this book has existed so long. In 1969, the revolution that was Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams on this book and this character happened. Their main goal was to move away from the camp of the 60s, would become darker, though not necessarily the grim dark we would know under Frank Miller, and back into a far more gray area of the law. It was also this Bronze Age resurgence that many of the modern versions of the rogues gallery would pop up, like the Joker re-emerging, Catwoman finally making a reappearance. Basically, every major interpretation of Batman generally stems from this re-emergence into the darkness, so to speak. And of course, all of that changed or got boosted up to an 11 in 1986 when Frank Miller would enter onto the scene with The Dark Knight Returns, and more importantly for the main continuity, Batman Year One, both of which becoming the de facto operating script for Batman mythology after Crisis on Infinite Earths. Short of it all, there were 713 issues of the first run of the Batman title, and it shaped and was shaped by popular culture. It officially ended in October of 2011 thanks to The Flash. Well, okay, technically now we know that the New 52 wasn't actually caused by Flashpoint, but by Dr. Manhattan. Yeah, that's another can of worms for another show. To try and keep this video under an hour long, Batman was obviously too good of a title just to drop off that quickly. So after the Flashpoint ending of everything, Batman Volume 2 would be one of the first waves of new releases, along with several other Bat books, and that volume would run from 2011 to 2016, with 52 issues, since that was also the gimmick they were doing for the new 52, but then they had another relaunch. DC Rebirth came in after a slew of presumed failures on trying to get readership to stop thinking so negatively about the New 52, like when they tried with the DCU initiative, or even just when they dropped the New 52 banner from their books, period. DC Rebirth is a strange assortment of taking whatever stuck to the wall during the New 52 and wrapping it all up in a nice, neat package. However, Batman was a bit unique because they didn't exactly reboot him for the new 52. Just changed everything just enough for it to feel like a new pair of underwear. It was just pinching in the wrong spots until it settled in. And that is the volume we are still at right now when it comes to Batman. But we are currently on issue 121, which will come out May 1st of 2022, so who knows what we'll be at when you're actually watching this in the future! And yeah, there is a billion other Batman comics that have come out since Volume 3 initially came out, but we won't be covering those here. So officially, let's go back to the then with Batman number 1 from the spring of 1940. Well, if you thought that was long, this is going to be a doozy. Yes, I absolutely took the quickest route to get through the title history because there's way too much to talk about with Batman proper. 
But all of that washes away with one simple cover. Even with a year of history before this in Detective Comics, this is iconic in its own right. By the way, I am reading this from a digital reprint, meaning they tightened up the line work and digitized the coloring, which I have vented about minorly on the reader's history of Cloak and Dagger, but essentially I don't like it mostly because it gives the artwork a very paint-by-numbers rigidity. The blacks are a hard black, there's no light fuzz to the lines that give it, for lack of a better term, I umami. The richness gets lost in trying to preserve the panels, as it were. It's also a major issue I'm having with the comics restoration project, but say it with me now, not the point. Back to the comic. There's four sections here, and I've got about seven pages of script, so let's not dawdle. We begin, as every Bat story does, with the origin. Okay, it actually makes sense here since this is only a year after the character's introduction onto the world, and this is actually only the second or third solo series that have ever spun out of National Comics. So while we all know his origin, let's take it from the top. Fifteen years ago, Thomas Wayne, his wife Martha, and their young son were walking home from a movie, which would later be retconned into the Mask of Zorro, or the Mark of, possibly the Gay Blade of Zorro, who knows, before they were accosted by a mugger. Thomas tries to defend them, but he gets shot. And then, so does Martha, because she won't stop screaming. Days later, in his grief, Bruce Wayne makes an unholy pact on the spirit of his parents to begin his war on crime. The years pass, and he trains himself in science and athletics, but there is one thing missing. A symbol. Famously, a bat flies through the window to become the iconography for decades to come. There is an alternate universe where it was a brick through the window and he became poor. Brumch. With his origin out of the way, though, we can get into the actual bad stories here. First, there's the Joker. And this is the very first appearance of the Clown Prince of Crime. I cannot wait for Dick Spring to tweak that design, but on this first introduction, with bags under his eyes, the pale skin, and a seemingly forced smile, he looks like basically anyone in the 2020s. And with a face like that, the Joker announces on the radio that he is going to kill the millionaire Henry Claridge and steal the Claridge diamond at midnight exactly. That does mean that there's a ton of cops sitting around on the property by then, though. However, as the clock strikes midnight, Claridge starts to laugh, then falls over dead, with a grotesque smile on his face, and in his vault, a fake version of the real Claridge diamond and a Joker playing card. Dun dun dun! The mystery doesn't last long, though, as we instantly go over to the Joker, talking to no one at all, about how he stole the diamond and injected Claridge with a 24-hour release Joker Venom. So it seemed a lot cooler when he called his shot on that. And yet, even though Batman and Robin know what's going on, they wait for the time to be right to go after him. Another night, and once again, the Joker calls his shots this time on Jay Wilde to steal the Ronker's Ruby. This time, though, at the stroke of midnight, Wilde dies and then the room is filled with gas. From inside a suit of armor, the Joker unmasks, having paralyzed the cops with a low-dose version of the Joker Venom, but he does kill Wilde with a blow dart, and thus, another clean caper for the clown. However, this new face is stirring up the hornet's nest of organized crime in Gotham, and the criminal element wants to take him out just as bad as the cops want to catch him. Now the time is ripe for some Cape Crusadering. Over at the home of the notorious gangster Brute Nelson, the Joker has come to answer the challenge that Brute put out against him. But before anything can happen, Batman busts in, not as gracefully as he's known for later in his career, and everyone sees him, and a fight breaks out. During the commotion, the Joker takes the time to shoot Brute and flee. But Batman finishes the fight just in time to hop onto the Joker's getaway car, and they fight. I actually love these sorts of scenes in older comics, because a fight like this, where it starts in a speeding vehicle, they leap from it before it crashes, and then they're fighting on a bridge, would be at least half an issue in today's decompressed storytelling. The narration alone would be as overblown and epic as possible, but this is basically just a page of a fight scene that ends with Batman losing in a one-on-one -on -one fight, being knocked off the bridge. While over the years it does wane depending on who's writing, the Joker is absolutely a match for Batman in a square fight, 
just as much as any other rogue, and with only a handful or so appearances, this is probably the first one that has ever actually been deemed a legitimate threat. After escaping once again, the Joker makes another radio broadcast about who he's going to kill next. This time, it's Judge Drake, someone who put him in prison before. With one officer watching him, the judge counts down the time. The major issue being that the officer happens to be the Joker in a moment that I'm sure is what inspired that scene in The Dark Knight with the Joker as one of the honor guard with a painted face. But Cop Joker kills the judge and then tells the cop outside that the Joker killed the judge and then he dips out of there before nobody realizes who he is. Well, nobody except for Robin, the boy Wonder, who follows the mysterious cop to a deserted house. And for another first, this is the first time that the Joker gets to smack a Robin in the back of the head with a blunt object. A truly time-honored tradition. How does Batman track down where Robin went? A legitimately neat little invention where the soles of Batman and Robin's shoes actually have chemicals that light up when an infrared light shines on them, so he's able to essentially follow Robin's footprints to where he's going. It is actually really always neat to see older comics and Batman use technology or scientific understanding that was outlandish at the time, but would actually seem very mundane in the modern world now. No, luminol and infrared doesn't exactly work exactly like it is in the comics, but it is a concept that we now take for granted, is essentially what I'm saying. It's at least a good way to get us to Robin anyhow in comic books. However, before the Joker can dose Robin with some Joker venom, Batman's able to break through the door, get the syringe out of Joker's hand, and lay a good POW right to Joker's face. That shot to Joker's face reels him back into his venom lab, mixing the chemicals and starting a small chemical fire. Joker grabs his paralyzing gas spray gun and paralyzes the Batman so he can escape. However, it is Batman and he's a protagonist, and this is the first real story in his solo, so naturally he's not paralyzed for too long, and he's able to rescue Robin before the place burns down around them. Fortunately for the ending of this, Robin brings up that Joker was boasting about getting the Cleopatra necklace, and Batman knows exactly where that's located, so there's no time to lose as they race over to the penthouse of Otto Drexel. Joker is not having a really good day, and just loses all nuance we've seen previously, and he just starts unloading his gun at Batman when Batman charges at him, who eats all the bullets because he's wearing a bulletproof vest. Again, a concept that we all know and love. With a last-ditch effort of throwing his now-empty gun, Joker tries to leap to a different roof to escape. Yet Robin's there to not only block that escape, but to actually kick Joker back off the roof. Don't worry though, Batman's there to catch the Joker before he falls to his death. And so, the Joker is captured, and now in jail. However, even behind bars, Batman knows that he is far too clever and far too deadly to be considered just another normal villain. Don't worry, we'll get back to the Joker shortly, but next up is The Giants of Hugo Strange. Hugo Strange was the arch-criminal of Batman, and in Detective Comics number 36, was caught and arrested. Of course, that means this tale begins with Hugo Strange leading a shootout to get out of prison. Bruce Wayne sits in his comfy house and hears the news broadcast of that escape and wonders what new plot Strange is planning. That plot is relatively simple. Ten-foot-tall monster men! Mostly just to cause havoc all over Gotham. Batman, however, is able to find Hugo's hideout fairly well, tracking the truck that the monsters keep escaping in. Batman, however, does get caught because we can't have exposition if he's too stealthy. Hugo Strange kidnaps some patients from a local asylum, which I do like to think, in my personal headcanon, was Arkham Asylum, but that wouldn't appear until Batman number 258 in 1974. And then Hugo turns those people into monsters and eventually has them loot the banks while in bulletproof clothing. Strange then does decide that the best option to get rid of Batman is to inject him with a monster serum. There's a lot of needles being shared in these comics and I'm not sure if I like it. So Batman gets knocked out and the monster men begin their heist plan. Using chemicals he stores in the heels of his boots, Batman escapes the cell they put him in. He then goes on a fairly large bit of manslaughter and murder. I wish I was joking. First, he punches Hugo Strange, who falls off a very tall cliff. Yeah, he's not dead, but that's only by sheer want to use the character again. Then the three monsters that are left at the shack attack. He knocks one out by bopping him between the eyes, and then causes the other two to fight to the death. 
And that's his plan. It wasn't a, I don't care if they die. He was banking on them killing each other. Then he goes and hops into the bat plane and begins to machine gun down the getaway truck. Again, making the decision to take their lives because that's what's necessary at that time. Think that's bad? After the truck crashes, he then strings up one of the monster men with a bat noose. Then the final monster flees King Kong style up to the top of a skyscraper where bullets are doing nothing. So Batman gas pellets the monster's face and the monster falls down to the streets below. While he may have just killed a slew of monsters, he knows that the biggest monster of all, their creator, Hugo Strange, must still be out there. And the story ends. I'm not going to get bogged down with Batman's morality here. This was still very early in his storytelling career, and consistency wasn't exactly a constant. So, while everyone argues about whether or not Batman should kill in the comments below, let's press on. Next is another first appearance. This time it is Catwoman in The Cat. This time we've got a nautical theme. We on a boat! Yes, there's a yacht filled with rich folks and a half a million dollar emerald necklace on the line. While Bruce says he can't really be there, he does send in Dick Grayson as a steward on the ship, generally just to keep an eye on everything. Dick pumps one of the other stewards for information. And we get the basic rundown of all the rich folks who are going to be part of this. Like the wealthy heiress, Mrs. Travers, and her nephew who's always begging for money, her doctor who's always taking her money, random dear old Mrs. Peggs, and of course there's also her brother, who, you guessed it, wants her money. Lucky for Dick, Denny, that's uh, Mrs. Travers' nephew there, tries to throw a paper overboard, but the wind blows it back onto the deck so we can all see what it says. It's a note from the mysterious, the cat, telling him to make sure his aunt is out of her room so she could swipe the emerald necklace. Dick does try to go over and save the necklace, but it's too late. It done been catnapped. While everyone's up on deck worrying, a boat pulls alongside. That's not such a bad thing since they say they're with the Coast Guard. They are in fact not. They are sea mobsters, the most cunning variant of the pirate criminal subclass. Their shoulders are usually really good at flotation devices. They're there to try and get the emerald necklace. But Mrs. Travers actually kind of laughs because someone already stole it, so she can't even hand it over to get them off the ship. That's not too bad, though. Everyone's still rich. And the sea mobsters decide to start frisking everyone. When one gets a bit too, let's shoot someone who's not complying, Dick jumps into superhero mode, still dressed as a steward, and saves that person before diving off the boat. Yes, Dick has his Robin outfit on underneath his steward's uniform, although I'm sure his shoes and cape are probably rolled up and balled up in his pocket or something. Either way, Dick's out of the picture, so these seafaring muggers basically don't find the emerald, but they do get everyone else's loot, and then they go back to their boat. However, these nautical nuisances don't expect that Batman has a bat boat. Well, to be fair, it looks exactly like their boat, so maybe this is the case that inspired Batman to actually get his own bat-themed boat. So Batman and Robin catch the crooks easy enough. However, Batman also has another idea, because he's just sadistic this issue, I swear. He wants to prove to the kids of America that crooks are just cowards when they don't have their guns, so the deal is that he will let all the criminals go if all four of these grown men can beat up Robin. The joke's on them, though. This isn't the first time that Robin's taken on four guys at once. <clears throat> and gets them to tap out and tie themselves back up. That proves that criminals are cowards to us readers, no doubt. Oh right, there's actually a totally different plot that this story was going, and Batman and Robin return to the boat, give the wealthy people back their money, as everyone does, but suddenly the fire alarm goes off. There's no fire, but this is where Mrs. Peggs, who I kind of forgot about in all the boy-on-man action, tries to escape. But Robin is actually really on the ball in this story, tackling the granny to the ground. But she's not a granny at all. She's a stunt granny. And of course, I can't not share the meme of the whole quieter Papa Spank because it's hilarious. After the makeup is wiped off, we get our first look at the Hedy Lamarr-inspired Selena Kyle. If you are interested in the entire history of Catwoman, every single issue she's ever appeared in, from the Golden Age to the New 52, then check out the Reader's History of Catwoman right here on this channel. Except for the New 52, that is over on Anchor and Spotify. And yes, it is long, but it does have multiple parts for your viewing pleasure. 
So, yeah, back to the cat. While she's asking if Batman has ever seen a pretty girl before, his actions kind of say that, yeah, he's never really had an erection before. I mean, it, it's true. He does refuse her, let's work together, big boy, proposal. But on their way to take her back to shore, she leaps off their boat, and Batman fumbles into Robin and allows her to escape. He doesn't say it outright, but he does go, no, that'd be bad, I would never let her, oh, nice night out, huh? Like the most suspicious little boy at the party. Like, legit, he ends the tale just by being, damn, she's hot. I'd sigh, but every story so far has been showing a different side of Batman, and the majority of men, and a good percentage of women, do become absolutely the densest people on the planet when it comes to a firm set of eyes. So it's not too off, character-wise. Just a bit suspect. But we're not done yet. There's one more story in this. Like I said, it is a quarterly book, so it's thick at over 50 pages a story, though the version I'm reading did at least cut out all the mini-comics and ads, which also cut out about 10 to 15 pages. But bear with me, this is the final story I promise, and it is The Joker Returns. Cue random shot of a silhouette Joker dabbing in front of a lightning bolt. No? Damn, okay, start donating to the Kofi so I can afford someone to edit that for me, please. We begin where the first story in this left off. The Joker is in prison. Not for long, or else there wouldn't be a story. Almost in a parallel to how Batman had chemicals to, that'll explode in his shoes earlier, he has stuff in his teeth that he mixes and kaboom! Blows himself out of prison and escapes into the night. Of course, that doesn't mean that Batman is going to go immediately looking for him. Bruce just wants to say that he'll be up to no good soon, and they should keep an eye out. Although, it is also weird to hear the Joker is considered shrewd, subtle, and ruthless. Ruthless, yes, everyone says that he's ruthless, but even in his first appearance, he was never subtle. So, for my catchphrase, long story short, Joker begins his radio broadcast and murder spree once again. First, killing the chief of police with some Joker venom inside a phone receiver, then he steals a famous painting, steals some rare gemstones, until he announces that he's going to go to the Drake Museum to steal the Cleopatra necklace. But this time, Bruce says that Batman will stop him. Could he just stop waiting three crimes, three murders, mind you, to start trying to catch this son of a gun? Hiding in a sarcophagus until his announced time, the Joker pops out, gassing all the cops in the room. The Batman's there so they can have another good old fight. Joker once again beats him in a one-on-one, -on -one, and the Joker actually almost finishes him off with a battle axe, but Batman rolls while he's unconscious, and then more cops are coming, so there's no time to finish him off. So the Joker escapes. But the police do still have an unconscious Batman. So naturally, what do you think happens? They try to unmask him. Dun, dun, dun! I do enjoy that they keep in the ad break cliffhanger panels, so building up to the, oh no, will he be unmasked, is instantly met with a turn of the page to Batman knocking the cops back so he can jump out the window. The failure of the police, as it always does, leads to a reformer complaining about the cops and the Joker and everyone, more than likely to ask for donations at the end of his rant since outrage is probably the most profitable business. Being so high up on his soapbox, though, that makes him an obvious target for the Joker's latest murder. Though, of course, the police are there, that doesn't save him. While waiting for his inevitable end, the reformer opens a brand new deck of cards, accidentally cutting his finger. But what's this? The deck is nothing but Joker's. And yes, he then starts to laugh and die with a grotesque smile on his face because the corner of the cards are poisoned. With that failure under his belt, Bruce Wayne goes to talk to his old friend, Police Commissioner Gordon. Essentially, this is Bruce Wayne just suggesting that they use the Joker's greed for rare gems to lay a trap, and Gordon agrees. The Joker falls for this trap, to be sprung upon by police wearing gas masks. I admit I actually may have laughed a bit where the Joker just decides to draw his regular gun and shoot the cops. They always forget about the bullets. The Joker flees the traps, chased over the rooftops by Robin. The Joker pays the boy wonder back from the first story by shoving Robin off the roof. But it's okay, kids. He finds a flagpole. Like the Joker would ever actually kill a Robin. Ha! But now it's Batman versus Joker round... What is this, three or four? With Batman batting zero. However, Joker pulls a knife. Now, I actually think this is where everyone always makes him a great knife fighter in future versions of the character, but that may be a premature assumption. 
Because the Joker stabs himself during the scuffle. Yes, seriously. And with one final dramatic laugh, he falls to the ground. Batman and Robin, just seeing a dude ice himself, doesn't want to stick around for the cops to ask about the dead body, so they book it down the street. But no, the Joker isn't dead. He lives to be a menace another day. Holy hell was that a trip and a half. I know that may have felt long for you, but I'm eight pages into the script and haven't even gotten to the now yet. There was a time when the price of printing meant that storytelling couldn't outright be decompressed as it is now. Looking over these, there's a Batman for all tastes here. The detective, the mystery, the drama, and even a surprising amount of Robin spotlight that expresses exactly why this character has lasted over 80 years at this point. But I'll wait until the conclusion for a bigger breakdown on that. Short answer, it actually holds up more today than many other comics of the time, and even arguably the Superman title that influenced its creation. But did the creative world agree? Well, we all know the answer to that since we all know who Batman is. But hey, let's hop 75 years later to Batman number one in 2016. Now, there is going to be some contention in the comments and on Twitter, because frankly, the new 52 Batman run was actually one of the very few good things, and arguably the best comic title, to come out of the new 52 relaunch. Scott Snyder didn't alter the character too much, and wrote what was a successful, as well as loved, run. While Snyder was off the book by Rebirth, that momentum meant that with a new number one coming out, all eyes were on this book. Oh, and for sake of clarity, I've actually talked about this issue before on my Twitter when it came out at AG Does It All, and I'm currently reading this from the Deluxe Edition, which also has Batman Rebirth number one and the first 15 issues of the Batman Rebirth comic series. If anything's changed in that re-release, I can't help it. So now, let's get this ball rolling with I am Gotham. Part 1, written by Tom King, penciled by David Finch, Matt Banning on inks, and the sensational Jordi Belair on colors. As a plane flies overhead, Batman and Commissioner Gordon are talking about a recent raid on Cobra. Uh, for anyone not in the know, it's essentially a terrorist cult led by King Cobra. They'd recently stolen three surface-to-air missiles from the military, and the GCPD has recovered two of them. Now where's the third? Well, obviously, it's directly above head flying towards that airliner we saw earlier. And this isn't Metropolis, so that plane does get hit hard. But this is Gotham, so Batman is already on the move as soon as he saw the explosion. I actually really like that Gordon also hops into work mode to bark an order. Leadership is about delegation as much as it is about action, after all. That's reflected also in the following scene where Alfred is apprising Batman of the situation, and Batman is already telling him to try and call Green Lantern and Superman, as well as talking to Duke Thomas, the latest in-training partner of Batman, also known as the Signal, to give him the trajectory and specs of the plane as it's coming down. It is actually a phenomenal scene that showcases that Batman is not a one-man operation, and that he does rely on other people. He may not be the smartest man in the world, but that doesn't mean that he's stupid. In theory, anyways. In practice, however, well, when no leaguer gets back to him in the time it takes for him to get to the Robinson Bridge, he says, Screw it, we're fine. This is my city. I'll save it. And he ejects himself from the Batmobile to land on the roof of the plane, all the while updating Jim Gordon about where he's planning on pushing the plane. There's also a really good look at the normal viewpoint, where you have one guy completely freaking out about any other city would have a superhero, and another name drop for Green Lantern and Superman, and said Gotham's going to kill them because they don't have a hero. While you're also seeing this kid just staring out the window, and there's something on the wing, some bad thing. Yes, bad is just going to do his baddie best, and he attaches jet boosters underneath either wing. With all the general calculations done between Batman and Alfred in dialogue, he ties himself up to the roof, and Alfred lights the fires. There's actually a joke where Alfred said that he turned a 747 into a bat plane, and while it is actually a good line, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Alfred meant to say a 737, not a 747. The only difference between the two is a 747 has four engines, while a 737 has two, but then again, that could easily just be a misprint on the comic, or David Finch went for a somewhat smaller aircraft, because what's about to happen makes a lot more sense with a lighter plane. 
Batman rides this sucker through Gotham, threading the needle between the skyline to crash into the river. It gets a bit overblown here. There is a couple pages, and there's a moment where Batman is asking, Is this a good death? Now, I mean, I get that he's kind of got time while waiting to crash the plane, but it really almost comes off childlike. In my mind, Batman acts without care for himself. He doesn't care if it's a good death. And even when he did die, when he went to kill Darkseid, which killed him, he wasn't doing this, uh, is this epic enough for the record books kind of mentality. None of that actually matters, though, as someone flies under the plane to lift it up and then ease it into the river. Batman naturally thinks it's Clark Kent, because that's what Superman does like every other Tuesday, it seems. But it's not. It's the newest Superman OC do not steal, Gotham. And his girl sidekick, Gotham Girl. And that's the end of the issue. Overall, it is a very good first issue. While the original first issue was given a wide range of, this is our hero, let's have some tales introducing how he does things, I think that Tom King sets up to give a good story about where Batman is, both geographically, since there is a lot of art faffing Gotham, named locations and the text and everything like that, but also where Batman is in the grand scheme of things. His connections with the police, or at least Commissioner Gordon, the backup he has in his ear with Alfred and Duke, And even the scene that I thought was a bit much, where he's asking Alfred if his parents would be proud if he died like this, all sets up where Batman is at the beginning of a story that essentially introduces a Superman and girl for Gotham proper. And while I try not to focus too heavily on the art styles here, especially comparing between the old and the new, David Finch nails Gotham for me, and that ink work just pops that art to being, well, gothic. And of course, again, Jordi Belair on colors has and will always make a book wrapped in a bow with just breathtaking color work. That being all said, what's the conclusion to draw here? Batman exists in a very special spot in pop culture. In 20 years, he'll have been around for 100 years. He's had tens of thousands of stories, either in solo books or as a team, in films, on cartoons. He has spun off a number of other titles and heroes that have even reached the top of the mountain, like Catwoman or Robin or Dick Grayson in general. He is ingrained in global pop culture at this point, even if some countries it's not to the extent of the Western world, granted. Bill Finger, Bob Kane, Jerry Robinson, Dick Sprang, all of these people in the early stages of Batman's creation and push into the world created and laid a foundation for a character that can evolve with the time. As tastes changed from detectives to vigilantes, from crime to silliness, and back into the shadows, there is a Batman for everyone. That is the grand truth of the character, and why any change in creator, be it Tom King starting the latest volume of the Batman title, although right now it is Joshua Williamson as of issue 121, or if it's a brand new movie in theaters directed by Matt Reeves, there's no true wrong way to do the character justice. Yes, I have my own personal version of Batman, and you listening at home do too. Those that don't read comics may have their vision of Batman as Kevin Conroy because Batman the Animated Series was their real long haul or first real introduction to the character. Other people may like Ben Affleck's role as the antithesis of Superman more than a character in his outright. None of those are wrong. Have there been bad interpretations? Sure. Most of us see anything outside of what we want for the character as a bad take. And that's alright to not agree on interpretations. But never assume that your subjective view is objective truth. It is very easy to compare different versions of Batman. His campy, goofy side would clearly not hold up in a fight against Lady Shiva. But Batman Brave and the Bold also paired him up in a very, very Silver Agey, world's finest way. All that being said, more people need to rewatch Gotham, at least after the first couple seasons, because it does have a fantastic Bruce Wayne. Alfred is one of my favorite live action versions, and it does actually have my favorite live action version of the Joker. Yeah, I didn't know I would end this video on that rant either, but there it is. If you agree, disagree, or think that maybe I should start working on the impossible to finish reader's history of Batman, let me know in the comments below. 
While you're down there, let me know what I should do for the next Then and Now Reader's History. You can also donate to the Kofi, which includes a fun thing about restarting Comic Sins as essentially solely a viewer-backed show. Even without any of that, commenting, liking, subscribing, and sharing is the best, freest way to help the channel grow. We have about 750 subs before you even reach the monetized level, so please help however you can. More than anything, though, I'm AJ Carey, the Comic Archivist, telling you to stay golden, Inklings.